Hello, my crafty friends. I'm so glad you're here to join me with this um, in this study on Job. We're studying Job chapter 2 today. And um, I'm going to read it first. And then I'm going to read some a little bit out of this book and some questions from this book. And then we'll read... Um, We'll read some out of this one, and then we'll make a postcard. Um, Job chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, from walking and down, up and down upon it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. <coughs> so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken, and he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women who would speak. Shall we receive good from God and not receive evil? In all this Job did not sin with his lips. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place. Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad, the Sh Shuhite, and Zophar, the Nam Namathite. They made an appointment together to come up and show him sympathy and to comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven, and they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. <clears throat> and uh, let me read a little something and then and then I'll ask those questions um, it says here for every ten people who can withstand the temptations of adversity only one can stand prosperity or so it is said. Oh, sorry, just that. Sorry about that. Um, when life is good, we have no questions. And when it is hard, we have no answers. Or so it is said. Drawing on your own life, why, why do you agree or disagree with that, those statements above? Um, you might think of an experience where you were tempted to doubt God's goodness. What questions did you ask? What thoughts did you have? Job handled his prosperity as a ministry and later defends his stewardship of abundance. And this is in chapters 29 and 31. But now he is plunged into excruciating loss, a living death. Job's new test will examine whether his belief in the goodness of God can be subverted by unalterably negative circumstances. Job will ask questions that are asked in wars and famines when people are faced with congenital deformities and terminal illness. Job will later take up the cause of all the nameless suffering poor, and that's in chapter 24. But right now, Job feels the weight of his own burden first. At this point in the story, Job's three friends travel a considerable distance to console him. What actions of these friends indicate they understand how deeply he's suffering? And then this is Let God Be God by Ray C. Stedman. And I'm not going to read everything he says, but I really believe this book is worth buying. Um, because he goes into a lot a lot more detail and 
stuff than what I'm going to read, but I don't feel like I can read you the whole book. That wouldn't be right. So I'm picking out the things I think are the most profound or explanatory. And, um, and that's what I'm going to read you, what I've got highlighted here. And um, the rest of it, you'll have to buy the book to read. But it's, it's well worth it. I got it used on Amazon. I don't remember what I paid for it, but it wasn't a lot. We tend to think of pain as a curse, not a blessing. And that's understandable. Pain hurts. Pain brings pressure to bear upon our bodies and our minds and our emotions and our spirits. But God sometimes has a purpose in our pain that we cannot see. And he is always present in our pain, even when we can't sense that he's there. This is one of the greatest lessons of the book of Job. From the beginning of this book, we are confronted by the argument that God is present in the life of every human being, even in the midst of severe and painful trials. Here in Job 2, we are given a perspective on Job and his sufferings, a perspective that Job himself is not permitted to have. It's important to realize that Job's perspective is limited throughout his trials. An understanding of that fact is important because the same principle is true during our times of trial. When we suffer, our perspective is limited, just as Job's was. We can't see behind the scenes of our lives during the times of pressure and trial. We don't know what transpires between God and Satan when we suffer. But these glimpses of the heavenly realm in Job 1 and 2 tell us something important. When we are put to the test, God is involved in our suffering. Our affliction is never meaningless. It always has something to do with God's eternal purpose. What does Satan mean by the phrase, skin for skin? And this was in Job 2, verses 4 through 6. This is apparently an ancient expression. In its context, we can see that the expression probably means that a man will give his skin to save his skin. A man will give everything he has, even his skin, in order to save his life. Again, Satan is claiming that Job loves God only out of self-interest. Strike him and Job's love will surely turn to cursing. That's the devil's wager. Satan is essentially... Satan is using essentially the same argument that he used in chapter 1. His philosophy is that human beings are self-centered creatures. They love God only while life goes smoothly. But Satan says human love is conditional. As soon as life becomes difficult and painful, they'll give up their faith and love for God. In chapter 2, God allows Satan to test Job not merely in the realm of his wealth and family, but even in the realm of his own body, his physical and emotional health. It's a sobering experience to realize that the tests that come into our lives are actually aimed at getting us to curse God to his face and tell him he's unjust, to accuse him of not keeping his promises. Satan wants to use our suffering to convince us that God is not truly God, that he's some kind of cosmic sadist or torturer. Notice that Satan uses the phrase, strike his flesh and bones. Here Satan has got, asked God for access to the total humanity of Job. Satan doesn't want to attack Job merely in his physical body, but in his emotional life as well. The word flesh speaks of Job's health. The word bones speaks of Job's inner man, his thoughts, emotions, and subconscious mind. God grants Satan total access to Job in his body, soul, and spirit. And Satan proceeds to attack Job in that same order. First Job's body, next his soul, and finally his spirit. This three-phase assault on Job constitutes the storyline of most of the book of Job. Satan knows what he is trying to achieve. The evil one is convinced that if he can get Job, get at Job in every part of his being, then he can shake Job's faith and cause him to turn away from God. Satan reasons that if he hurts Job deeply enough, he can goad Job into cursing God. Because all of his life is in God's hands, <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me, because all of life is in God's hands, he created us and the universe we live in. He gave us life, he can take life away. He determines the length of life for everyone. He simply takes back what already belongs to him, the gift of life. <coughs> a single individual death can hit us very hard and make us doubt God's goodness. We ask, why, Lord, did you allow this to happen? Are you sure you didn't make a mistake? 
Sometimes we learn of the death of the death toll that is simply staggering and beyond our comprehension, and we wonder, why did God allow that war or that terrorist attack? Or why did God allow that earthquake, that hurricane, that devastating tsunami? Sometimes terrible things happen in the world, and people die by thousands or ten thousands in a single day, in a single event. And we ask, why, Lord, why did you allow tragedy to strike the world on such an imaginable scale, unimaginable scale? Here again, we need to gain a different perspective, God's perspective, on tragedy, loss, and suffering. We see a disaster unfold on CNN or Fox News and we think, oh, what a horrible loss of life. And it is horrible. It truly is. But at the same time, we must acknowledge that our perspective is different from God's perspective. When we see tragedy on our TV screens, we are only aware of that one tragedy. We are aware only of the hundreds of thousands of people who perished in that one event. God, however, is aware of every single person who suffers and dies. Every moment of every day in every part of the world. Did you know that around the world about 154,000 people die every single day? And God knows each of them by name. You may think that God is unfair when he allows thousands of people to die in a single event, such as a tsunami or an earthquake. But is that really any more unfair than the 154,000 people who die every day from heart attacks, cancer, malaria, AIDS, car crashes, falling in the bathtub, and countless of other causes? What makes one death fair and the other unfair? The reason we have the book of Job is so that we can catch a glimpse of what God is doing in the universe. There are reasons for our pain that we cannot see in this life, that God sees and God knows. He is working out his purposes through our lives and in our suffering. Every trial and test we face has a purpose. Through our pain, God manifests the plans of his mind and the compassion of his heart. Here we see um, Satan's first attack on Job's body. And um, the description of the painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head is generally interpreted as referring to boils. Painful, pus-filled eruptions in the flesh usually caused by staphylococcus infection. Whatever Job's illness was, it turned him into a pitiful, repulsive, horrifying figure. Here he is, covered with agonizing sores. He's not only physically afflicted, but he's also painfully humiliated. He ends up sitting in the ashes, scraping the pus from his, stores with a broken, from his sores with a broken piece of pottery. As if his pain isn't already at the limit of human endurance, his wife, who should be a source of comfort and emotional support, says to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Her faith has already been shattered by Satan's attacks against Job. Remember that she too has lost her wealth and all of her children. In her own pain and grief, she has lost her ability to see God as loving, good, and just. She sees her own suffering and Job's as proof that God has forsaken his promises, that God's word is not true. Clearly, Satan is using Job's wife as his instrument against Job, just as Satan used Eve as his instrument against Adam in the Garden of Eden. I'm not saying here that either Eve or Job's wife were possessed by the devil, but those two women did permit themselves to be used by Satan when they yielded to the temptation to disobey God. What two things is Satan saying to Job through Job's wife? First, Satan urges Job to give up on his faith, to become apostate and an enemy of God. Curse God, his wife says. Second, Satan urges Job to commit suicide. Curse God and die, she says. So Satan, through Job's wife, clearly suggests to Job it would be better for him to take his own life than go on living like this. Job is already drowning in pain, loss, disfigurement, and humiliation, and now his suffering is intensified because he has been emotionally abandoned and spiritually abused by his own wife. In Job 2.10, we see the results of the second round of tests that Job has inflicted, I mean, excuse me, that Satan has inflicted on Job. Job's, um, he replied to her, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. That's um, Job 2, verse 10. Job's rebu rebuke is gentle. He does not attack his wife. He does not say, you foolish woman. 
Rather, he gently says, you are talking like a foolish woman. He points out that her words represent a temporary lapse of faith on her part. And they are no different from the words of a foolish woman who do does not know God. But he does not attack her personally. Moreover, he goes on to speak words of grace to his wife, encouraging her to return to the faith she once embraced. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Job said. He saw that his wife had fallen prey to a false philosophy that is still common today, a belief that life ought to always be pleasant, and if it's not, then we should give up on God and on life. Though God in his love and grace has provided many blessings in this life, he did not create us merely to spend our lives having a good time and pursuing pleasure. Even in times of pain and loss, our lives were meant to have meaning and purpose. An outlook that abandons life and faith as soon as living becomes difficult is shallow and a distorted view of living. Don't abandon faith in God when hardships come because that is exactly what Satan wants us to do. Our adversary wants us to resent God and give up on our faith. If we surrender our love for God in times of trial, then we are giving Satan the victory he seeks. And this we must not do. He has not only taken Job's children and all of his possession, but he has also taken away Job's health. What's more, Satan has also assaulted Job by making him feel abandoned by his wife. This sets the stage for a ma the major argument of this book. The most devastating attack on Job's faith doesn't come through his physical trials, as painful as those have been. They come through an attack on his spiritual relationship with God himself. From the text, we can see that these men had to travel from distant places, so a certain amount of time must have elapsed while Job was suffering. It took time for word to reach these friends and time for them to agree to meet at an appointed time and set off to visit Job. Probably weeks, if not months, passed while Job was undergoing this intense trial of suffering. When his friends arrived, they were shocked at the sight of him. When they saw Job, this man they had known and laughed with and prayed with, singing... I'm sorry, he wasn't singing. <laughs> Sitting in a heap of ashes, scraping himself raw with broken pieces of pottery, they responded with the same intensity of grief as, as if Job had died. When they wept and tore their robes and covered their hands with dust and then observed silence for seven days, they were, in effect, holding a funeral service for him. These were the ancient rites that were reserved for the dead. We should always remember what we saw in Job 1 and 2. God is the one who is in control of Job's life, including his sufferings. Though it was Satan who afflicted Job, God gave Satan permission, and he did so because he had a plan for Job's suffering. God never tells Job what this plan is, and that's instructive to you and me because we usually don't know what God has planned um, for our suffering either. So we empathize, we empathize with Job. We understand his feelings because we too have experienced the anguish and desolation and questioning that suffering brings. But there is an answer. God does have a reason. He has a plan that encompasses not only all of time, but all of eternity. And our trials and sufferings are part of that plan. Sooner or later, we all experience times of trial and testing. To be faithful to the truth of Scripture, we must recognize that God himself allows these trials in his life. Um, excuse me, in our lives. Even though God permits us to suffer, he does not delight in our suffering. Satan is the one who takes pleasure in our pain. If Satan had his way, we would all suffer and perish. But God guards and keeps us, even if he temporarily permits hardships and aff affliction in our lives. We have the promise of God's word that it will never be more than we can handle. Job proved that. True, we sometimes feel that our pain is more than we can bear, that God is pushing us beyond human endurance, but that he will not do. Instead, God teaches us that we are stronger in him than we ever imagined, and his life and power are strong in us. That is the message of the book of Job whenever we find ourselves under the pressure of pain. <clears throat> we are stronger in him than we ever imagined, and his life and power are strong in us. Of course, we have to allow him that position to, um, you know, by, with our faith. <clears throat> I did uh, find a song to put on our postcard. I'm doing that as the base. 
And um, this one says, have thine own way, Lord. Which is kind of where we have to be. Um, that's where we have to be if we're going <clears> to... <throat> I'm trying to decide what's I want to um, make sure I put it in the right spot so okay. <laughs> I know I'm going about this a little bit um, particularly but I, I want this to be centered <laughs> okay now I'm going to get some glue out okay and I need my glue book Well, I'm, I'm making this video a couple of days before before you will see it because it's gonna sh it's gonna air on Father's Day, which um, it's gonna be a hard day for my family, and um, I decided it would be better to to do this in advance than on that day. Um. Okay. So that's what we're doing. Ethan is taking a really cool trip this weekend. It's also tomorrow, um, Sunday. The day you're watching this is also Ethan's birthday. And um, he found out, he um, he's a history buff, especially where ships and planes are concerned. And um, he found out that the uh, USS Texas battleship is in dry dock in Galveston. And that it... Um, while it's in dry dock, they're doing a limited number of um, tours. They're just doing tours on Sunday afternoons in June and July. And so um, this is kind of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And for somebody who loves that ship as much as he does, it seemed like a good birthday present to let him go and see that. So... So that's what he's doing. Okay. All right, there's our our base. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I pulled out some things um I thought it might be, you know, fun to, um, let's just take a bit of this and we'll see. I thought we could put this on there. Just, I'll tear it down closer if we decide to use it. But, um, we could put that on there and it would be probably like this I think that's cute I've also got this that I got in Happy Mail and um, it's really pretty and I love that it's not there's no repeat on here it's like you know a piece of art <laughs> So we could also, you know, put this on there. Or we could just take a little bit of it out and put it on there. 
Um, and that's those two things were the first things I got out, and I thought that that's kind of what I wanted to do, but I'm not so sure. Um, well, let me let me shut this so it doesn't dry out. I've also got um, some things in here and in here. I just grabbed a couple of packages of stuff. I don't don't know for sure what's in here, but <laughs> but we're gonna we're gonna look and see. So we've got washi tape stickers over here, which would be pretty on here, I think. And then we've got stuff over here too. That's a pretty butterfly. We've got, you know, stuff like this. But I think I'll, I want the washi tape stickers if I'm going to do something like that. And I don't think there are any butterflies in here. It's just plants, I think. Yeah. So we might keep the butterfly. But um, well, that's a cute stamp, too. I'll stick it there just in case. I say that, and then here I'm looking through them because I'm not 100% sure that... <laughs> I'm going to just stick those things there. No, that's cute too. I'm sure we're not going to use all of these, but I'm just trying to find some that I think we might can come up with something. Oh, let's keep these because they might be better than what we've already got. Okay. These are things, I can't remember if I got these from Timu or from Amazon, but um, this this bunch, I'm pretty sure I got from Timu. These, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Sorry. I don't know for sure. cute it's funny it looks like Christmas but those are four leaf clovers <laughs> which doesn't look particularly Christmassy but everything else about it looks like Christmas to me I'm trying to see if there's anything okay We're going to put these aside for now. And I'm going to play with this and see what I can come up with. Okay. And we may use these. I don't know. Right now I'm kind of in the mood to use this and see what I can see what I can do. I'm going to spread it around. You know, we've got some really cute birds. Okay, let's go about this a different way and see if we put like butterflies in the background. Hmm. Okay. OK, 
Okay, right now, I like these two pieces. I want to see. I can't tell if these are on washi or if it's if the if the white is really white. Okay, they are on washi, so that's good. That means I don't have to trim them. So yay, that's nice. Okay, let's go ahead and see if we want to put some some of these down too, because we could put like this there. funny how easy it is to um, pull out something like this and then how hard it is to choose between the things. That's kind of pretty. No, I want something to go on top of that. This right here, I'm not so sure about. But I do think I want something. I'm gonna, hold on just a minute. I'll be right back. I decided to try something else first. And so I stuck a flower there. And I might like that. But I really... Um, I'm not sure. I'm trying to find something that maybe is a little bit brighter. I don't know why I want it to be brighter. <laughs> I'm not typically one who says, oh, let's get something brighter. But for some reason today, I'm wanting something a little bit brighter. Okay, we may want to do it. Maybe I don't need a butterfly quite that big, but I really like that blue one. Okay, let's try this one. That's not as big. But it needs to sit somewhere. Nope, it won't go that direction. And this one's the same thing. It goes like that. that one that's just trying to find a place to actually set it it's, okay tell you what I'm gonna do I'm gonna go ahead and put this one down and then we can see how much things really disappear and all of that Okay, let's Okay, that does pretty good, doesn't it? Okay. And Do we want that or do we want No, I like it more like this. But that... 
makes everything head in that direction, which doesn't work. Let's see if we could, maybe if we do this. Decisions. That's the hardest part of this. Just making decisions. Okay. I think we're going to just kind of go with that. And then we will see if it needs something else afterwards. Oh, no, go back, go back. Hmm. I still am not, I'm just struggling with this. Um. I'm going to pause and go do something and come back and let it sit a minute and let me let it veg in my mind. <laughs> okay, I think this is what I'm going to do. Um, hopefully we won't regret it. Okay, we're going to just go ahead. Not because I think this is perfect or exactly what I had in my head, but because... Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, because now those leaves are going to come through the butterfly's wings and be visible. Mm, let's see put this on here and let it stay there until I, I need it again because that's not going to work. Uh, we're going to cut this one out and um, yeah. See, even when I thought I had decided what I wanted, <laughs> I changed my mind. out of the way okay I went ahead and cut that out while we were um, I paused it to cough and then I went ahead and cut that out so that we can now if I can get the paper off the back come on Well, I'm going to pause again. I don't want to spend five minutes trying to get this off. Okay. There we go. That little butterfly looks better. I tried really hard. <laughs> I tried really hard to get that big one, but it just wasn't going to. It just wasn't going to go.
I'm going to go ahead and do back here. Okay, now we'll write today's date on it. Six dash eighteen dash twenty three. My first baby is twenty four years old today. <laughs> wow. Okay. So here we go. I like it. If you want to win this one, put a comment below and I will give it away just like I'm doing all the others. I'm going to have that video soon, I promise, at least for some of the, you know, first half of this month. Um, anyway, I'm happy with that. God bless you. I love you. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.